kid. Seriously. Welcome to a zesty return of the Kids Seriously podcast. This is the only podcast around that's going to going to flip you a coin because we're sorry about the mess. Every so often we get together to discuss the news in the realm of the Star Wars universe, answer some questions that Kids Seriously got, analyze interests from around the realm, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Flying Rio for Cooter, but Chewbacca for me, it's fan favorite Luke Neitzel, who is not a Canadian, but you'd never guess it. And to my right, way to the right... Coming to us via the Holonet from 12 parsecs away, if you round up, it's Mark Neitzel. Boys, how are you? I'm I'm good, and I would have been an amazing Canadian, and I have that conversation with my mom all the time about how she cheated me out of being from Wisconsin and not being Canadian, and I have to live with that shame every day. Mark, what's... You want to know how I am? Yeah, I want to know how you are. Okay, so my wife left me for the weekend. <laughs> I'm glad that sentence kept going. I was a little afraid there. I'm home alone. I had a cold can of Chef Boyardee ravioli for dinner. Dog crapped somewhere in the apartment. I can smell it. Can't find it, but I can smell it. Um, I'm sitting here in my underwear, um, drinking really shitty whiskey, and I'm talking to you two chuckleheads about Star Wars cartoons. Well, that sounds fantastic. Away from being a Kevin Smith movie. (laughs) I like Kevin Smith movies. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we, we have a bumper here, as Luke told me two weeks ago. So we're going to get to the news. Can, before, okay? before we get to well, the news, can I, can I just tell Mark that his dialogue is better than a Kevin Smith movie? Oh, that was a deep burn. But now we can bumper. After the unfortunate and untimely death of our princess, Carrie Fisher, about a year and a half ago, Star Wars fans have been speculating how the story of General Leia would end. While some called for the use of CGI and others preferred to recast, the prevailing and most popular thought was that Episode Nine would ultimately take place after a long time jump and that the character would ultimately die off screen. But not so fast. Now that filming for the latest installment is underway, J.J. Abrams has tweeted about his alternate path. With the approval of Billy Lord, Fisher's daughter, Abrams plans to weave unused footage from The Force Awakens into the story into the next movie. The director mentioned that he never intended to recast or use CGI, but he was dissatisfied with any of the conclusions to the Leia story that were in front of him. Boys, a couple questions here. Are you satisfied with the decision? Are you worried at all about this footage and how it's going to fit in? And what would you do given the same set of circumstances? Well, I've got an answer to all three of those questions. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed. What I was hoping is that they would find a Carrie Fisher lookalike and every time she was on camera, they would have her standing behind a picket fence, a la Wilson from Home Improvement. <laughs> um, I, I think that would have been the real classy way to go. I, I would have. I was in the same vein, hoping they'd do a Bella Lugosi, and she'd just hold her white robe over her face, and she would just be someone's chiropractor that looked like her from the the face up or whatever. I, I'm okay with this. We'll have to see it in context. It's hard to really know. I think without knowing any of the context of it. This is the best solution they could have come up with because no one's going to be satisfied with recasting. Everyone will be annoyed and pissed off with that. And CGI is always going to feel a little weird and awkward at this stage, especially that it didn't get a good reaction in Rogue One, even though I didn't mind it in Rogue One personally. So I I think on paper, this is the best way. I mean, we don't know what that footage is, so hopefully it's good footage. footage They can make it work. Um, We've seen other examples of them do this. The one that jumps out at me is in the the Sopranos when um, and I I can't remember her name, but the woman who plays Tony Soprano's mom died, and they had a Thank you, yep, and they had a, a scene with her that was all footage where they tried to kind of wrap her her storyline up, and it is so badly done and awkward looking that it's cringe worthy to watch. But that was you know 15 years ago, so hopefully they've advanced from them, and you know you you want it to work out. As best they can, it, it would have been probably awkward to have her just be dead off screen as well, too. So there isn't a smooth solution. Hey, hey, Luke. Call Boris Karloff a cocksucker. <laughs> I don't get that reference. For me, this is... If they feel that this is going to make the better movie, then that's the option that I want them to go with. I was kind of hoping for the off-screen death with the large time jump. 
But at the end of the day, what we've always said on this show is if it, if this is what they feel makes the best movie, we want the best movie over everything else. And so um, I think it'll be kind of cool. I really like how they spliced in old footage into Rogue One, not the CGI portion. When we talked about Rogue One, Luke, you were okay with it. I was one of the people where I had a really negative opinion of Tarkin. Alternatively, when they showed all of those old pilots who were and brought those guys in through unused footage, I thought they did a really good job. Are they going to have enough of it? Is it going to fit with Princess Leia? I guess we'll find out. But I'm, I'm. If this is what they feel best with, let's go ahead. Let's do it. So I think it's about that time, guys. It's time for Lithuania's favorite game show. Okay. Now here is a quick programming note. We are recording these episodes back to back. We have some vacations coming up. And so in our next episode, we are going to skip the news section and get right to the show or get right to the, uh, am I right or am I wrong? So, uh, for next week, if you don't hear the news, nothing happened. Um, that's just, we're just trying to, uh, to record these back to back. And by the time it gets to you, it's not going to be news anymore. So anyways, um, it's time for Lithuania's favorite game show. It's am I right or am I wrong? Here's how our two player game works. There are seven questions. Champion goes first in the first round, while our challenger will go first in the second round, and vice versa in a serpentine style, befitting the fantasy draft fairness that we all strive to be. Like, that was a weird way of putting it, but I'm just going to keep going. At the end of each question, the point will go to whoever's correct, or if their answers are similar, whichever one the moderator, and today that's me, likes better. If there is a draw, there is a draw. No overtime here. You need to win it in regulation. Last week, in epic Chicago Cup fashion, I, Maya Madrid, fumbled away victory by forgetting Stacy X, of all things. Luke, still undefeated, is going to face Mark tonight, and there's going to be an automatic doubleheader rematch right away next week. Gentlemen, are you ready? Let's do it. Get it on. All right. In addition to the comments about, like, I just, for those of you listening at home, uh, Luke just gave the fist pump for the, uh, who is that guy? Uh, ref- the ref, I don't the know. The death Yeah, the, the. The claymation death fighting match? whatever. Oh. Mills Lane, that's what his name is. We, we grew up in a better time. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, question number one. This goes to Luke to start us off. In addition to his comments about Leia, J.J. Abrams was also quoted as saying, the opportunity to sort of take what we had learned, to take the feeling of who these characters are and what they are, and give them the final cha- chapter, that felt in the spirit of what we'd begun. It was too delicious of an opportunity to pass up. Is this just a filler... Um, a filler by Abrams, or is it a tacit nod and wink to Hater Nation out there? I've seen both comments. Uh, I, I I think that is the most bland, generic response you could possibly give. So, um, and good for him if he's able to rile some people up because they just want to be riled up. But that that is that is straight out of a PR one hundred and one. Have a long response that actually says nothing. And to Mark. I don't even think he said it. I think they got some intern in the PR department at Disney to type that up and tweet it out. <laughs> well, the point's going to go to Luke here. It is, as I have in my notes here, it's a trick question. JJ's trying to appeal to everyone to have his cake and eat it too, saying lots of words like he said, but not really saying much. So we one to zero, Luke is ahead. Question number two goes to Mark. Urban Meyer has been put on administrative leave after allegedly keeping a wife-beating villain on staff after not one but two incidents of domestic violence. To make matters even worse, Meyer called out the reporter who was investigating the story, calling them a liar at the Big Ten media days. One day later, screenshots of text messages from the victim to the coach's wife emerged. By the end of the day, the coach was under investigation. Boys, away from the seriousness of what happened happened, and the victim of these crimes, many people around the country are taking satisfaction in the likely downfall of a divisive coach. Obviously, we would prefer it to be something victimless, but which sports personality would you like to see knocked off his or her pedestal via scandal? I think I would like to have Jerry Jones' heart explode via cocaine overdose in the back of a limo with at least two underage girls. Very good. All right. To Luke. Well, he... he... He took what I wanted as a person, but he went in the different direction than I wanted it to go. I want him to still be alive, but I want him to be walked in on having uh, homosexual intercourse with Mike Pence on an American flag while not having his hand over his heart. That would probably be my ideal 
situation. Now, this these are both excellent answers. Um, I'm going to get to the one that I had written down. I said Leo Messi has already admitted to using steroids, so I'm going to have to go with Gerard Piquet. In my dream world, Shakira would dump him from Sergio Ramos. That would be my like perfect uh, ending to that whole story. But I like both of the answers. I don't know if you guys knew this, but I actually met Jerry Jones one time, and he was a super big jerk to me. So in the craziness, and since I'm making up the rules, I give you both a point. I would love to see Jerry Jones knocked off his pedestal. So the score is 2-1. to one. Luke, the question is going back to Luke. Number three. The Harrison Ford jacket from Empire Strikes Back is expected to fetch almost a million and a half dollars at auction. What's one piece of Star Wars memorabilia that you would pay big bucks for? I'd like a full-size Millennium Falcon in my backyard that I could sleep, live, and play in. All right, Mark? Well, if my wife doesn't wind up listening to this, I would like the original gold bikini. If she is listening, hi, Angie, I want Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber. Those are excellent answers. I have to go with what I had. I had listed anything from the Falcon. It goes three to one to Luke, much to my chagrin because I'm really pointing... Really hoping for Mark here. We need a new cha- champion. Number four. The question this time goes to Mark. Major League Soccer just had its all-star break. Opposed to other leagues here in America, players are chosen from le- from the league to play an exhibition game against another, usually European, super team. This year, the festivities took place in Atlanta, one of the crown jewels of the league. Gentlemen, we cheer for teams that are pretty bad. So let's not talk about us. Let's talk about them. What is the best club in the league between being competitive, fan support, and on-field total success? Which I guess is like being competitive, and I should have revised this, but oh well. Uh, Atlanta is a tough one to beat, but I am actually going to go with Portland uh, because they have a history in rivalries that Atlanta doesn't have. Uh, Yeah, there's less people there, but that stadium is packed. Every game, it's passionate, loud fan base, and they've got some real hated rivals in Seattle. Whereas Atlanta, what, beats up on Orlando? Yeah, Orlando's their quote-unquote rival. Which I do have a friend who's a huge OC fan, so I you know, respect, but fair enough. Luke? Well, I, I'm sorry, you got to go with Atlanta. I mean, they're setting transfer records as far as what they're spending and they're doing it the right way bringing in these young amazing talents like martinez and el marone and they're going to turn around and sell el marone for all this money uh seventy two thousand a game i mean come on you know like you can say that's great portland sells out their stadium i mean so does kansas city but atlanta selling out a stadium that's three times as big it's not going to be long before atlanta catches up on trophies and maybe the on-field rivalry hasn't been as great with uh with Orlando and with, with DC United, but heated fan rivalries, wow. I mean, they have to be, they, they've had incidences of fighting and all those things. So, like, from a fan standpoint, that is as intense as any rivalry we have in MLS. So, I mean, Atlanta's doing everything right, and it, it sucks to cheer for a team, and then you're in the same boat too, Mark, that's been around for forever that can't seem to do anything right and watch the, the new kids come in and just clean it up like this. But I, I'm not going to say anything bad about what, Atlanta's doing so the those are both great answers and I think those are those are both correct answers um but as the rules go I have to first look to what I have written I have written Portland down as the team in my opinion uh when you when you judge all of it so um but I would put Atlanta sort of 1a in there so we go back to Luke it's three what is it three to two three to two and we go back to Luke Luke, Padme Amidala is getting her own set of novels. We know neither of you will actually read it, but is this finally the chance where the character will get her due, or do you think they're going to somehow make her a damsel in distress that the Clone Wars show has turned her into? Well, I am optimistic that it won't be that, and I think some of the reasons it won't be that are this isn't under the guidance of George Lucas, who originally kind of crafted this hollow stereotype for Padme that they ran with in the Clone Wars series. I think just the times we're living in between Me Too, between the success of movies like Wonder Woman, where we're trying to push more realistic and fully fleshed out female characters to the forefront and actually allowing women creators to take charge of these characters is going to push us in the right direction. So I'm very, very optimistic, but until they actually have an author 
up there stepping up willing to to do it I, i'm always going to be a little nervous that it's going to be generic but I, i'm, I'm going to choose to be the optimist this time and say that they're they're going to they're going to go in the right direction on this one finally taking the cloak of optimism how does that feel for you it's such a new a new jagged for you to wear nah, eh, every now and again mark yeah i think at this point you can't really introduce any other major characters into the story that are going to overshadow her as far as fan recognition. Um, you can't really have Anakin or Obi-Wan or anybody in there because it will almost immediately become their story. Uh, I think that really the only thing left to do with Edna is to make her a sort of an action hero star of the book. I mean, otherwise, there's nothing for the character to do, really. So that's the only way to go with it, I would think, and actually expect to sell any books. So in the in the pre-show, we were talking a little bit about old high school times and high school rivalries. In high school, I was on the debate team, and we had what was called, sometimes you get a squirrel vote when you'd have multiple judges, and that was when uh, 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 the, you'd want to keep it close. So, ah. so one of the judges was. So I like both. So the that, what that means is Luke technically got it right, but Mark's getting the point. No, they you both got it right. I like both of your answers, but Mark is getting it because we're gonna keep it close. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't give it to him if he got it wrong. It's cool, man. I know no, you would. From him. You would give David Arquette your championship belt too if you had the chance. <laughs> hey, I forgot the score. What's the score? <laughs> three to three. Is it okay? Good. With two left. Number six, this one goes to Mark. Mark, the Disney merger with Fox looks like it's set to go through. Give us your thoughts. Best one wins. Disney merger with Fox. Um, yay capitalism? The Gambit movie will be 400 times better than it ever would have been if it stayed with oh, Fox. Oh, Luke just goes through the throat. <laughs> what I have written here is anyone who mentions Fantastic Four in more than a passing way wins the point. But Luke found a way to go even above that and brings Gambit home. Luke gets the point. We go to seven, and he's in control here. <laughs> he knows me too well. I feel like that was an unfair question. Uh, number seven. Guys, a prisoner in the Cleveland area was ordered to have his mouth taped over because he would not shut up in court. Given the opportunity, who is one person whose mouth you'd like to see taped over either physically or metaphorically? Who goes first? You go first. Oh, Taylor Twelman. A hundred percent. I tried to watch the All-Star game, which I don't normally do because my my son wanted to watch it, and he spent the whole time screaming at me. Uh, I, I just don't understand how that style is is fun for anyone. And when he's not screaming at you, he's just pretentiously talking about why teams aren't doing what he would have done like it's the most obvious thing in the world, uh, which explains why he's such a great coach and non-trophy winning player. So Ooh, let's, let's shut Taylor Twelman up. Stu Holden is significantly better. As I once said, uh, Taylor Twelman is the bad guy from every 1980s <laughs> Yes, <movie>. he is. <laughs> All right, Mark. Similar vein on going to go with Alexia Lawless because I don't need to hear any more about how set pieces win games. That's vicious. I actually have the lady from the NRA is the one that I would prefer because I'm so sick of her. I, I think now is time the time that we can start talking about gun control or maybe it'll be tomorrow or maybe the day after. Um, those are both really good answers. Luke has the one point lead going into this question. So he if he gets it, he wins. If not, it's a tie. This one is going with Mark. I hate Alexi Lawless more and it burns me more because he used to be my favorite player in 1994. And so that one is a deep burn, but I also have a, 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 an irritation towards Taylor Twelman. So it ends in a tie. We'll have the automatic rematch next time around. Still undefeated. Still undefeated. All right, so let's move to uh, the other segment that we got here, uh, questions that kids seriously got. Boom, age seven, writes, what movies are coming out that you guys are looking forward to that aren't Star Wars? I am, and, and Boom, you, you know my son, we are um, surprisingly excited for Aquaman. It, it looks colorful and fun and dumb, and it's the perfect movie that I can take an eight-year-old to, and he'll talk to some fish, and my son will think that's amazing, and he'll punch some stuff, and you know I'll make Point Break references in the back to no one but myself, and it'll be fantastic. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, Aquaman, because he really likes that, and then without him, I really, really am excited for the second chapter of It, because I liked the first one a lot more than I thought I would. 
Or not, I have a similar answer. I am looking forward to not Aquaman, but Shazam. Shazam, for that movie to work, needs to be everything that we saw in the trailer. And so even though I have kind of left the DC universe for, for all intents and purposes, I am kind of excited to see Shazam. Mark, anything that you're looking forward to? Oh, yeah, so having to slog for all this Star Wars stuff, um, I got a real nerd boner when I found out that Dennis Villanueva is doing the Thinking Man Star Wars uh, in June. Excellent. Yes. Now that, it, it will either be absolutely amazing or it'll be a hideous mess with Sting and a jockstrap, and either way, I'm excited and shit. So, Mark, one of the things that I am really want to, to get into is Dune, but it's so confusing because there's diff there's a series and there are two different movies and then there are books and I don't know where to start. Where would you recommend that I start to see Dune or to experience Dune? You start with the book Dune. Okay. That's it. That's, that it so, first off, it, David Lynch's film, just watch that after you've done everything else and you can just you know, see it as a goof, right? Because it's horrible. I, I mean, it's epically bad. But the the original series is six books by Frank, um, I think it's Herbert, that Herbert or Hebert, I, I don't know if he has any French-Canadian in him. So he did six books, and then he died. And so basically his story wasn't finished because the sixth book ends on a cliffhanger. So his son and some dude who writes you know, fantasy books, took his notes and basically made their own careers off of building off of his universe, taking all of the character-based motivations, political intrigue and philosophy, chucking all that out the window in favor of Star Wars-like action. Mm. So you can go ahead and ignore all of those. The sci-fi series, I watched some of it. It's good enough to not be enjoyably bad but eh, it's not it's not that great so th this is my my wonder mark because uh, i read i read the first two books and i'm going to assume that villeneuve's movie is going to be based on the first book yes is it possible to complete that book in a, a even two and a half hour movie like that's yeah. that's what I struggle to see is are they is is he plotting this out as as a trilogy or because man there there is so much that happens in that book even though the book isn't insanely long it's just really dense. Yeah, no, he's actually the first book will be two movies. Okay. So the hope is that yes, given enough room with two movies, they'll be able to better go into the other characters and it's some of the, the sort of deeper politics that are involved we'll see though it it may be awful what do you guys think about the casting of is it timothy chalamet I, I i don't i haven't seen anything with him in it i know he was in call me by your name but he's gonna play paul atreides how do we feel about that i only saw him in Lady Bird. i didn't see call me by your name but he he fits the bill to me for for what i would expect it's a really small sample size i'm going off of but i i'm not worried about that and I think if you look at Villeneuve's other movies, he's made really good casting decisions, and I think even... Oh man, if, Emily Blunt, like, that was just inspired. And and even if you question some of the other pe people, he's he's gotten better performances out of them. Like, people like... Like, Jeremy Renner, I don't personally think much of. I think he's the same thing in everything, but he's better in Arrival than he is in most things. So I, I, I have confidence in, in whatever he picks, personally. Well, I did see Call Me By Your Name, and I don't think you could find a better actor of his age right now to play the part. He's phenomenal. Beats um, Shia LaBeouf. It, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear God. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't fit exactly what, in my mind, the character looked like, but, you know, it's as far as the quality that he's going to bring to the role, that more than compensates for him not looking exactly like I would have thought. And, and I'm still, my, my unfortunately, my visuals were uh, after the seeing the movie first, so I just picture Kyle MacLachlan in. You don't like Kyle MacLachlan? I like Kyle MacLachlan. No, but Kyle MacLachlan probably wasn't the best choice for that role when they did it, so it, I don't think he was a good representation of it. I don't know. Patrick Stewart was the only good casting decision in that movie. Yeah. 
Well, fair enough. We better get away from the Dune universe before we piss off too many people and get back to the Star Wars universe. Let's get to Season 2, Episode 3, Children of the Force. The first step to correcting a mistake is patience. excited for your eight-year-old to hear all about Dune. <laughs> Written by Henry Gilroy and Wendy Miracle and directed by Brian Keelan O'Connell, Cad Bane continues on his nefarious journey to root out the Jedi Lockless for his shadowy benefactors. Take it away, Luke. So the narration is just a recap of the last episode where they basically thought they killed Cad Bane and blew up the holocron. But uh, we we basically know that he just disguised himself as a storm or a clone trooper and is on their ship. And this actually episode actually starts about 30 seconds in before the last episode ended. Which is new. That's something that we haven't seen before. Yeah, so we see that scene, but we kind of see it from a slightly different angle. And that is all the troopers getting off of their little ship and onto the big star cruiser with the soldier who was Bane, who was injured, trying to walk away. And Ahsoka is trying to talk to him and find out if he's okay when everyone realizes that he has been bleeding green blood on the spaceship, which allows them to know he is not a clone. And they realize he is Bane and a fight breaks out and he is able to escape in a starship. Did you feel that he escaped way too quickly? I mean, I feel like it was such a lead in and such a cool sort of situation. I really wanted him on the Star Cruiser a lot longer. And granted, it's different writers, and maybe this is like this is where you start, and they had to switch, you know, switch things. But that was kind of a disappointment to me. I think you could say that phrase for about every sequence in this episode. Oh wow! I think this is going to be a reoccurring Spoiler. theme. Spoiler! Ooh. Yeah, that got exactly to what is my overall criticism of this for later. Wow! So, so we're gonna disagree here. All right. Then we move to the council being disappointed, but um, not as much as uh, you know. I was disappointed that Ahsoka was back in her tube top, but. They're, they're pissed off, and uh, we go to Bane then, and he's speaking with Sidious, who tells him he needs to grab four of these sense, four sensitive children and take them to Mustafar, which Bane agrees to do. The main four Jedi that we're dealing with, Yoda, Mace, Obi-Wan, and Anakin, they have a joint meditation, and they, yeah. all, they all see different planets where Bane is, I guess, abducting these four children from. Do you kind of wish that Matthew McConaughey was like a Jedi, or they had a Matthew McConaughey character who was like beating on the chest for that and like getting yeah. ready to go? I felt like that's just what that scene needed. Yeah, and they kind of they kind of do this a couple times in this episode, so it's it's a little a little odd, but hey, why not? So they they decide to dispense the Jedi to different planets. So Anakin and Ahsoka are going to Naboo because, of course, he saw Naboo and they want to rescue a Gungan Force kid. While Obi Wan is going to Rhodia because there's a Rhodesian, which is the race Greedo is. There's one of those kids okay. that Bane is going I after. I will say this, okay, maybe it's just because I'm a uh, a dad, but my kid has maybe just put a spell on me. But that baby Rhodian, that like guy that my heartstrings, that was one cute, no, cute, cute little character. So that yeah. got me. That was I'll take that over Porgs. <laughs> Yeah, well, apparently my kids make me feel nothing because uh, that kid didn't do it for me. But <laughs> Bane, Bane pretends he's a, a Jedi on Rhodia to talk to the mom and basically convince her to give up the kid because the only way to prove you're a Jedi is to put a robe on. And <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty stupid. Yeah, and, and she believes him basically. And he actually kind of tells her the truth in a certain way, telling her, hey, there's people trying to take these kids, so I need to take him. Otherwise, that's the only way he'll be safe. And... She, she believes him. He's got some type of hypno thing he puts on her as well. And then... Yes, Ob which, quick, quick, if you have that hypno ray, why are you wasting time trying to con her? Just throw that bad boy up and say, hey, I'm taking the kid and go. Well, why haven't you been using that for the last six episodes is the real question. You could have... Because the plot needed it right then. Yes, yes, it did. So Obi-Wan shows up too late and, and he's kind of like, well, I'm a Jedi. Let me do what I want. And she thinks he's one of the guys coming to steal Jedi kids. So they have a little bit of a tussle or whatever, and then he convinces her, hey, the Jedis don't carry blasters, so that guy couldn't have been a blaster even though he used a hypno device on you. And uh, But he's, he's too late. So then we go to Naboo. Before we get too far away from uh, Rhodia or Rhodesia, I guess I don't know the name, I thought it was Rhodia, but um, before that, that plan, we're seeing a real change in the production value of this show, where in the first season it was very sparse, 
barely populated planets where now not only is the visuals and, and those sorts of things uh, better, but there's a lot more effort being put into making these worlds seem whole. And that was something I really appreciated about this episode. Yeah, you are right. They do feel like real lived in worlds, which they always felt like just abandoned cities in the last last season of the show. But um, Ahsoka and, and Anakin confront Bane on Naboo. He's going after a Gungan child, and they are able to capture him. So he is again captured, and uh, he is interrogated by our main Jedi, but he won't say anything and won't tell them where the holocron is. So they decide to combine their Jedi witch powers and all do... All together now! Yeah, they all do mind tricks on him, which... They, they kind of don't want to do because it, it might destroy their mind, except for Anakin, who seems super excited. Which, that part of me was like, yes, they're finally being true to the Anakin carrier. This is a character. This is not a good guy. This is flipping Darth Vader, dude. Of course he wants to do that. Yeah, and he should be he should be pushing the lines of mm-hmm. what they do. This is makes more sense than just throwing temper tantrums in Revenge of the Sith. So they, they start to do it on him, and it starts to get him to tell it, but really they end up having to stop because they're about to obliterate his mind. And... It proves to be successful, not because they got the trick to work on him, but just because they tortured him so much that he is willing to now give them the information they want. But he isn't just going to tell them. He basically is going to make them go with. So Mace and Obi-Wan take Bane to go get the holochrome in deep space, which seemed like an odd choice to me because if he's already got the holochrome and he's had it for a while, wouldn't you? And you know he's abducted children. Why aren't you more worried about getting the children than the holochrome? Yeah, I mean, what, at no point did they even consider that he could have just downloaded the list to Excel? And well, they, they yeah. threw in the, it's not been copied, like, somehow they could tell. Yeah, but still, they should, my first thought would be, tell us where you're taking the children, not where our stuff is. But, you know, this is the Jedi, they are insanely selfish. So, we do have a little sidebar moment that really doesn't fit in the show, but it is something I liked, which was a little Anakin and the Chancellor talking in talking to themselves and the chancellor kind of trying to influence him a little bit visually it's the best part of the show and i think what i'm hoping is that they're trying to set up a wedge between anakin and ahsoka because in that mo- in that moment uh, the the um chancellor shuts the door basically on her and she gets separated from him that's what i was hoping for anyways yeah, and it's it's good because we've ne- we've never seen them interact, and obviously, as we know in Revenge of the Sith, he refers to him as a mentor and a friend. So it's nice to actually have a hint that they know each other for once, finally. But it really has nothing to do with the actual story. Uh, Anakin and Ahsoka do kind of some examination or investigative work on Bane's ship. They're able to kind of retrace the planets he's visited and decide that Mustafar is their best bet at where the kids could be. And I really liked the way that they did this. I thought tracking down Bane's whereabouts through fuel was actually really intelligent and really creative. For all we've kind of ragged on the series at points, that was a creative way to do it, and I appreciated that. But at the same time, Mustafar, really? Isn't it better if Anakin's first time on Mustafar is when he becomes Darth Vader? Too many callbacks for me. To me, though, it makes sense that that's the, the Sith's kind of main main staging ground. I, I assumed that that would be a, a important planet, and that would be why they moved the Separatists there in Revenge of the Sith. So I was actually okay with it, though I think for the most part you're probably right. They're just calling back to do callbacks, because they, they love that. I, but but I think that that causes a problem then in that, well, I, I mean, I guess now that I'm thinking about how crappy the Jedi Council is, maybe not, but wouldn't that kind of put Mustafar on their radar as, hey, this is a planet where bad stuff goes down, and you know maybe we should pay a little attention to it. So that it would become not a good place to hide the separatists. Maybe, but it is supposedly way out in deep space, and they, as we get to, it's it's a small base that they basically destroy, and the rest of the planet's basically kind of abandoned. So I, my guess is, is they kind of just went, oh, this was a nothing planet where they had a one-off little thing, and the Jedi are not good at this. They're really, really arrogant and unthorough. So. Um, it, that, that aspect, it would bother me if I was actually strategically looking at what they're doing, but as far as how it works for these characters, it makes sense to me that they would then ignore it. (laughs) Well, on Mustafar, these kids are undergoing some type of Sith training where they're going to have surgery on them. And they're in these like little, little containers basically getting a slate was it slave circuitry or something like that yeah because they want them to be kind of jedi spies like they aren't going to train them to be sith they're just going to send them back to the jedi with this stuff in them and sidious is communicating via hologram because obviously he's on coruscant 
because spoiler alert, he is the chancellor. But uh, the these medical droids are are working with them, and back at with Bane and Mace and uh, Obi Wan, they end up at the space station, which is just kind of floating in an asteroid, way out in the outer rim, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, and the holocron is there, but Bane obviously has a bunch of booby traps in there, so. He sets off a bunch of lasers that the Jedi have to fight, which they should have been able to handle easily, but for some reason they can't. And that allows Bane to escape for like the eighth time in the last two episodes. <laughs> so he gets he gets out of there, but they do get the holocron back for whatever that's worth. Anakin and Ahsoka then are examining Bane's ship. As we said, they get to Mustafar and they land before the surgery can start. And the kids are about to be evacuated out of the facility and they're going to sink the facility into the lava. So Anakin and Ahsoka have to fight these nanny droids while they're holding the children, which which actually I kind of liked because it, it gave relevance as to why the Jedi couldn't just immediately crush some nanny droids because they're trying to be slightly delicate. So there was a little bit of a battle there, but they're able to get the kids and escape. So where we end up basically is kind of where we started with Bane's whole storyline. Bane is still out there and free to do whatever he wants, but Sidious' plan has failed so it sounds like mark and i might be in a little different boat than you so i'm curious to hear your feedback on this episode Maya. all right so first of all i'll get right to the rankings i have this as my favorite episode so far early in the season i rank it one um for the reason is the production value is the highest that we've seen um i think that them going through these longer stories and getting deeper into it has been really cool but the negative to this um is the plot holes that you guys have mentioned i think you're going to focus on but it's also plot heavy versus the themes that we had in the first season. For all of the faults of the first season, what I liked is it was very theme heavy. And Luke and I have talked in the past, like I'm much more about theme than plot. I'll take good themes and sort of plot holes and that sort of things. If it really meshes together with the characters, this is a caper. And so that's what I didn't like. And these first three episodes have been really light on themes. Um, and so I'm kind of longing a little bit for... Uh, for season one but nevertheless it's my favorite episode of the first season uh i gave it two minutes because it just jumped around constantly from one scene to another nothing was developed or given time to breathe i like we said before the whole um cad bane hiding as a stormtrooper that's something you could have expanded to at least half an episode on its own that would have been interesting but it was a case of oh no we need to get through this in order we can get to the next point in order we can get to the next point and it was just this constant nothing's developed nothing's given time to be explained it's just get it in there get enough of it so that we can get on to the next thing and the whole episode just felt really rushed to me and i would say the same thing like it felt like they were just trying to wrap everything up so they could be done with it did you mention, is this a, this a different set of writers? Yes, it is. Because I almost wondered if they just didn't like this and were trying to wrap it up really quickly. And and Mark hit on the main things I want to say. The the bigger one, you know, he, he points out the example of they could have done a whole episode of Bane on that ship running around and them trying to pursue him. But I think what was always intriguing to me about this whole storyline and what is the most terrifying and emotional is the Sith targeting these children and all these things that they could come and do with these children and they went through it so fast that the kids were in danger for probably less than a minute of screen time and i think that was a really really frightening concept that they could have done a lot with but it just felt like they rushed everything through to be done with it rather than take time to explore it and i think that's too scary for a kids show not based on some of the other things that they have done and some of the things i know they're going to do so, and, and if you're going to open that door and tease us with it for two episodes, I thought this was just a really unsatisfying way to have it all culminate. So maybe further down the road, they'll pick this storyline up again, uh, which actually I kind of thought they might in the next episode, but then I looked and saw that they, they don't. Um, so it, it was a disappointing end to me for what was a really exciting start. Now, this is not bad on the level of things we saw in the first episode you know this isn't jar jar hijinks level bad but i'm I'm just disappointed because i thought they set something up really well and just totally whiffed on the end and it felt like they whiffed because they didn't try speaking of jar jar i did like the fact though that the gungans didn't speak at all in the entire episode i thought that was a, a nice way to sidestep one of the more problematic things from the original lucas trilogy uh so then i'll go back to luke's Here's why I think I rank this a little bit higher is I don't think the Cad Bane story is an end. I think the next episode, which I just alluded to, unfortunately, um, is is just a a sidestep to a grander story. 
and so I don't think there's a finality to it. That that's what I'll hope for, but but that still begs the question: Why didn't you do more with this episode? No, for then? sure, for sure. So, all right, um, that's our recap of what was that uh, episode three of season two. Now let's move on to some other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. All right, boys, I want to keep it short and sweet with my thing. I am knee-deep in Game of Thrones. I just finished season four. I'm going to go home and watch episode one of season five. I got nothing to add, all right? That's basically my whole life right now. Luke, what's Has going Frodo on with you? Frodo destroyed the ring yet? What's that? Frodo destroyed the ring? Not Frodo yet. I really want to see that, that, uh, that little guy bite off the finger of somebody now. Not not uh, Tyrion. I meant Gollum. Is what I meant. Wow, uh, wow, that was classless of you. I didn't mean it like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it takes like is one of the best best actors out there. I'm yeah, sorry. no, he's uh, he's I mean, fabulous. He's by far the best character on that Gollum show. It just came out weird. I hope shit. he's in Dune. Oh, he'd be awesome. Yeah, he would. So I watched um, A Quiet Place, which is a movie that I had wanted to see in theaters and just never got the chance to because I'm a horror movie guy, and it's nice when you actually get high production value and a uh, good cast in a movie that's well-reviewed and taken seriously. And I, I really enjoyed it. It's well done. It, it's scary. It's tense. There's surprises. It has more to say than just we're just trying to be violent or scary for the sake of being violent or scary. And one of my favorite things about it is, is it said everything it needed to say in 90 minutes, which movies don't do nowadays, and that annoys the shit out of me. Real quick, Luke, I have to ask this, because if you are one of those listeners of the show where you listen really in detail, you know how Luke feels about Jim. My question to you, and this is a spoiler for A Quiet Place, so if you don't want to hear this, stop now or skip ahead. Do you get to see Jim killed? You do get to see Jim killed. Yeah! All right! I know that was big for you. All right. Yeah, and you know what? But that didn't even occur to me during the movie because he does a really good job. And it was nice for me because he's, as we mentioned, not an actor I think that much of. I think he's kind of the same one note, and he was not that one note in this. So he, he was good. It's a pretty impressive directing debut. Emily Blunt makes everyone better that she is with. So I had a really good time. I mean, my biggest complaint about it, it's one of those movies where the world is, you, you have to you have to be able to put a lot of aside because, because of the type of world they're existing in, there's going to be lots of holes that are in it. So obviously that happens, but I don't, I don't have those complaints. But the creature design, I think, is pretty bad. That was the disappointing part. One real quick question I got for you. Um, obviously, Jim Halpert, Krasinski, whatever uh, his name is, was one of the finalists for Captain America in the Marvel Universe, the, the role that actually went to uh, Chris Evans. If Jim, your buddy, is cast as Captain America, how much does that hurt the Marvel Universe and from where we are now? I think we'd still be fine. I think his movies would still do well. I think he would have been serviceable. I think Chris Evans is probably better. Um, so, but I, I don't. Th- I think Marvel would still be fine. I don't think that the MCU is squarely resting on Chris Evans' shoulders. Um, even if you want to say that those movies are the best, which they probably are, the best overall trilogy. How much more credit do I give to the Russo brothers for it being the best trilogy than I do specifically for Chris Evans? And I really do like Chris Evans in that role. Well, see, you're talking about my favorite character and my favorite actor in that whole series. Everyone's your favorite character, so it's hard That's to narrow it down. That's not true in the series. It's not true. Um, Mark, what's going on with you? So I've actually got a question for the both of you for okay. my other nerd stuff. So um, as probably none of the fans out there know, um, I am a San Jose Earthquakes fan. Um, I started watching MLS in 2011. Um, I became a season ticket holder in 2012 and stayed one for the next six years. Now, I like to think of myself as having been a diehard Earthquakes fan. Um, I've invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of love into this club, uh, and seeing an increasingly diminishing return on that time, energy, and love over the last couple seasons. Now, The reason this is an issue is because in the next couple months, my wife and I are going to be moving to Portland, Oregon. Ooh. Yes. Now, this isn't the first time we considered it. Actually, about three years ago, we thought we were going to possibly move. And so at that time, we put our names down on the waiting list for season tickets for the Timbers. Um, And at that time, we were like 3,700 on the list. 
Um, and even though we didn't move, we just left our name on there because it was only a hundred dollar deposit and why not? So fast forward to now, we're moving up there and because of the expansion to Providence Park, our number is going to be up. So next season, we will be Portland Timber season ticket holders. So my question to you both is this. Um, I don't want to become a Portland Timbers fan over the San Jose Earthquakes, but I know it's going to be difficult living up there being a season ticket holder, the fact that they're a much better run club than the Earthquakes are. So I'm curious on your opinions on the morality of me eventually changing over to being a Timbers fan. Well, here's what I'll say. I'll take it first. Um, Look, I had a situation, my, my first ever team that I liked, quote-unquote, when when the league first came out, I thought DC United had really cool jerseys, but I was from, you know, I consider myself from, I lived five years in Southern California, and so the Galaxy were my team, but I never really paid attention, and then because I, I, I came, right in 2006 I started watching soccer, because all of my friends hated David Beckham, I was like, I like David Beckham, so I'm going to like, you know, Real Madrid, and they had a player, Robinho, that I really thought was fun to watch, and then he came to the Galaxy, and so the Galaxy was my team. Now, that all changed when I moved back to Wisconsin and started going to Chicago Fire Games with your brother, and really what happened is I took a, a trip. We went to Toronto FC on a bus trip, and that's kind of a moment when the team just, like, it just calls to you and you just realize that th it's just going to be the way it is. And now I'm fired till I die, and, you know, and it was just, it wasn't that I, that I felt like I wanted to abandon the Galaxy. And I, and I had actually flown across the country a couple times to see, like, I saw him in Denver, um, and I saw him here in Chicago, and in a couple different situations for the, for the Galaxy. But eventually your team just kind of selects you. And so if you go to those games and you're feeling it, like there's nothing from being able to be close. There's nothing like being able to be close to a team. The only exception to that, like I am not a Brewers fan, even though, you know, I mean, I have, it would be like the same thing. I'm not a Brewers fan. And I'm actually less of a Packer fan because of some of the fan base issues that we talked about last week. So it's not always, it doesn't always happen, but I also cheer for the Badgers now. I went to a Badgers game and it was the same sort of thing. So eventually your teams kind of choose you, man. And whatever happens, it happens. And I'll support you no matter what. Well, and you'll go to a game and uh, get when they play each other. And then the you'll way. know immediately. Cause I had the similar scenario. I, my cultural identity is all built on being Minnesotan. So I cheer for Minnesota in every single thing, but they hadn't had an MLS team. And uh, when we moved within driving distance of Chicago, I became a big Fire fan, and I've been a big Fire fan, and it's been one of the most unrewarding experiences <laughs> of my life. But I've been a Fire fan for uh, 11 years now, or whatever, and I'm a season ticket holder as well. And I had that conundrum when Minnesota came into the league of, who am I going to cheer for, and what's going to happen? And they didn't play each other until August that year because they only play once a year and I was like I'm just gonna see what happens and I was a fire fan the entire time and I knew I was a fire fan the entire time and if I just naturally ended up cheering for Minnesota I'd be a Minnesota fan for, for a Loons fan but I'm I'm just not I'm I'm a fire fan so you'll you'll go to a game and and you'll you'll know and there is something to be said about having that sports culture when you're moving to a new city of being able to fit in with other people so that that's a way to make friends and and to talk to people and relate to the locals. Um, though I suppose there'll be a lot of people there that you can talk to that are Californians that are ruining Oregon for the the real Oregon people. It's Oregon, not Oregon. Oregon. Get that right. I actually did that on purpose. Oh, to did you state the point? Because right. yeah, somewhere a friend of the show. Yeah, very a very that. angry man named Pete would have hit me <laughs> if he had heard that. But uh, yeah, you, you'll 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 find it yourself. I already know what's gonna happen. So. Oh really? What's gonna happen? You're gonna stay a Quakes fan. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. That's what I think will happen. I think I think you'll see the Quakes play the Timbers in in Portland in your Portland season tickets, and you'll be a Quakes fan. That's my guess. Oh yeah, I mean that's what I'm anticipating. I mean I'm going into this not wanting to change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I understand. Okay, the first time I see them, I will know. But I I am just concerned for my mortal fandom soul that if. I do make the switch that I'm committing an unpardonable sin. And, uh, uh, in the words of your brother, Luke Neitzel, like what you like, man. Like, let's just get over it. I don't like Last Jedi. He loves Last Jedi. He doesn't like Force Awakens. I love it, man. We're, we're, we're past all that. Just be what you are. Own it. Love it. 
Whatever tickles your fancy. That's what you got to go with. You're not a Sounders well, fan. Well, except for the Sounders. Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, Sounders <laughs> suck. Let's just all agree there. We hate those guys. All right. So that is, uh, that's going to do it uh, for us for this episode. Uh, Luke, where can the kids find you? Luke underscore Nitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L on Twitters. And Mark, you're still playing the uh, the Heidi game, right? Um, on the advice of counsel, I am not answering this question. All right. Well, for me, I'm at Maya Madrid, and I will answer the question. We are out of here. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.